Well, good morning. It is a beautiful Lord's Day, and we have been blessed with some warm weather, cool weather, rain, and a lot of different things, <laughs> haven't we? If you take your Bibles and turn to the book of Judges, we'll be looking at Judges 13 to 16, which gives away a lot about what we're going to be talking about, but we want to look at some emotions that sneak into our lives as we consider being blinded by arrogance. Christian author Bruce Larson was going on vacation with his family, and they were visiting uh, a national park, and so they were going for a drive, and he and his wife were in the front seat, and his kids were in the back. And so uh, Larson said they saw a sign that said, nature is camp three miles. And he said, hey, it's a beautiful day. The kids have been in the car for a long time. So why don't we just see if we can find some trails to, to walk on, on that naturist, at that naturist camp just a few miles down the road. She said, hey, I think that's a good idea. And so they turned off and began to make their way to this naturist camp. And on their way, they saw some people coming toward them in the opposite direction. And uh, they were about four or five people riding bicycles. And as they got closer, it became very obvious that they weren't wearing a stitch of clothing. <laughs> and suddenly he understands naturist is not the same as nature. <laughs> Those words are totally different. And so a bit of panic sets in, and he's worried about the kids in the back seat. And so he decides, you know, I, I need to turn around and go the opposite direction, but, but I don't want to turn too quickly and catch up to the bicyclists. And so they're driving in silence, and, and suddenly his, his youngest son, who's in the back seat in the back, goes, he goes, Dad, did you see that? <laughs> and he said, yes, son, I saw that. He said, Dad. None of them are wearing helmets. <laughs> there are some things that he just couldn't see because of a blind spot uh, from the back seat, that is. Well, in this series, we're, we're talking about some of the things that are hard to see. And we've got to check our blind spots. We have to intentionally, intentionally look for things that can be hard to see. Blind spots that can catch us off guard. And so this, this last week, we, we talked about Cain and, and about the blind spot of anger and how it starts in a flash and it's pointing to, to something that's going on in our life that our life needs uh, and it needs attention. Maybe it's fear, maybe it's out of shame or guilt or, or whatever, but it, it, it's, it's coming from somewhere. Well, this week, we're going to be talking about another character in the Old Testament. And when we talk about this guy, when we think about him, we've most of the time we just focus on, on one single event in his life. And that would be Samson and Delilah. And how she goes and cuts his hair and he loses his strength. But there are actually a lot of unchecked blind spots that are in the life that, uh, of Samson that leads to this particular moment. And so we're going to start in, in Judges 13 there in verse 1, and we're going to look at Samson, some things in Samson's life that I think will help us even in our own lives as we start taking a look at some things that we might have unchecked as far as blind spots. And so Judges 13, where we start off reading verse 1, again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, so that the Lord delivered them into the hands of the Philistines for 40 years. Now, this isn't the first time this has happened. In fact, the book of Judges, we see this cycle run throughout where the people of God start doing either uh, what's described here as in evil in the eyes of the Lord, or sometimes it's doing what is right in their own eyes. But the people of God stop living like the people of God. And, and so they begin to experience some consequences that... Either God must just step away from, or God allows them, and in this case, to con be conquered by an enemy nation. And they experience some hardships, and then they cry out to God, and they ask for help, and they ask for a deliverer to be sent. And, and you see this cycle go over and over in the book of Judges, and you see this same cycle in the Old Testament. And it's all pointing to Jesus 
who's going to one day come as our Savior, deliverer, and save us from our sins once and for all. But the people would cry out for deliverance, and God would send somebody to rescue them. We see they rebelled against God. And they've been prisoners now of the Philistines for 40 years. And the Philistines had a way of conquering nations. Uh, in, in, in those days, after the battle, after the war, that instead of trying to make their enemies submit to them through attacks of, of violence, the Philistines would try to assimilate them into their culture. They would try to assimilate them in through intermarriage. And so other kinds of cultural indoctrination. And so they would try to make them so that the enemy that they had conquered would blend in and would be like them. And so that's, now this nation has been conquered, not through violent attack, but through subtle assimilation. Now, this is a sermon for another time and, and another place, but it's worth mentioning here that sometimes the enemy attacks that way. Sometimes it's not so obvious. Sometimes it's, it's not a violent affront. Instead, it's this subtle assimilation, and that's what the Philistines were doing to the Israelites, and that's what Satan does to us. But in this account, in this story, we, we don't actually see them crying out to God for help, but rather God decides that he's going to send somebody to, to rescue them from the Philistines because they're about to lose their distinctiveness. They're about to forget who they are. And that's where Samson comes in onto the scene. See, his parents were struggling with infertility. And so God sends a messenger to tell them what's going to happen, that they're going to have a son, and this son is going to be and have a special mission for God. Verse 5, it says, you, and this is the messenger to the, to, uh, the parents, you become pregnant and have a son who's... Head will never be touched by a razor because the boy is to be a Nazarite, dedicated to God from the womb. He will take the lead in delivering Israel into the from the hands of the Philistines. So they're told, the parents are told that they're going to have a son, that this son has a special mission, and he's going to take the lead in freeing the people of God from their enemies. Now in Numbers, the sixth chapter... It tells us a little bit about these, uh, na this Nazarite vow. In Numbers chapter 6 there, one of the things it tells us here is that, uh, number one, is that you're not to cut the hair on, on your head, which is a reference here to what we read in, in our text this morning. Number two is there to avoid all alcohol. They were even, not just alcohol itself, but even to avoid the fruit of the vine. Number three, they weren't to touch a dead animal or a dead carcass of any kind. These are three commitments of a Nazarite. Now, the thing here is, is this was chosen for Samson. This was chosen for Samson. His parents dedicated him to the Lord in advance of his birth. It was chosen for him, and it, it's not something that he chose. In chapter 14, we this, see this man who's destined to be a hero. He had some pretty significant blind spots that would show up in his life. And as we read through this, you could label this that are blind spots of, uh, of pride. Pride isn't always arrogance. Now, sometimes it is, and we see that a lot of times in the life of Samson. But sometimes it was, it was insecurity. Take, for instance, uh, the... The pride that, that pride is, or think of pride, is kind of a double, uh, two-sided coin. And on one side of the coin, you have arrogance, where you're thinking about yourself a whole lot more than you really need to, and you're thinking you're better than you are. And then you have, on the other side, insecurity, where you're always trying to prove yourself, always trying to, to prove that, that you're enough. And we see Samson struggle with these things. Why would a man known to be for his physical strength feel insecure? Why would somebody with the physical strength and all the stuff that Samson had, why would he feel insecure? But he does. He does. And he's always trying to prove himself. He's always trying to, to show his, his strength. 
and he's easily offended by people, which is a sign of insecurity, a sign of pride. Society doesn't tell us that today when they talk about everybody being offended, do they? It shows you the sign of pride. So we see this first blind spot come up in Judges 14.1, and the one that I want to draw attention is, is that first he refuses to listen to the counsel of others. This is a huge blind spot. I mean, if there's someone in the passenger seat of the vehicle that you're driving and they're telling you about something that's down ahead on the, in the other lane and you just, just decide to ignore it, I mean, that's a huge blind spot. But we see this in Samson's life. In, in, in Judges 14, 1, it says, Samson went down to Timnah. Now, Timnah is a village that's four or five miles from where Samson lived, but it was in Philistine territory. And so he's going there to find a woman. And so when it says that he went down to Timnah, it's just not telling us the ge geographical direction, but it's telling us something about his spiritual direction. And the decision here is going to set the trajectory of his life. And it's going to be something that he's never able to come back from because he disobeys God. Samson went down to Timnah, and there he saw this young Philistine woman. It says, that, and that when he returned, he told his parents in verse 2, he says, I, I've seen a Philistine woman. Go get her for me. Sounds like a diva to me. <laughs> I mean, he has to be a, a male diva for sure. And, and he says, go get her for me. He, he, he says, I, I have seen this woman. I, and the in, in New King James says, get her for me as a wife. Samson sees something that he wants, and so he tells his parents, go get her for me. And his parents immediately, you know, they, they start saying, Samson, check your blind spot. And his parents know what God's will is for their son. His parents try. They, they know what God has already made very clear in Deuteronomy chapter 7. And what he's made very clear in Exodus 34, that the people of God were not to intermarry with the pagan nations, people who were worshiping false gods. And it was a clear command in Scripture, and Samson was ignoring it. No doubt his parents had raised him to understand what was going on here, and he's switching lanes. He's switching lanes, and, 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 and they see him making this mood, and immediately they try to get him to stop. Verse 3 says that his father and mother replied, isn't there an acceptable woman among the rel our relatives or your relatives or among all of our people? Must you go to the uncircumcised? Must you go to these pagans, the pagan Philistines, to get a wife? And they're telling him, you've got to check your blind spot. And Samson is dismissive and defiant. Because when somebody's trying to give him counsel that he needs to pay attention to, he does what a lot of us do. He doesn't pay any attention at all. He's dismissive. Or maybe for you, it's just maybe being defensive and, and being defiant. And, and, and we typically do what we want to do. It says that Samson replied, go get her for me. She's the right one for me, the NIV says. Literally, it's like, she's right in my eyes. And sometimes when a person's in the passenger seat next to us, maybe it's someone who knows us best, who points out that there's something in our life that, that they see and uh, we can't see our tendency, is to almost immediately become defensive. That's what our, our natural tendency is, to almost immediately become defensive. And, and we are immediately aware of the truth that's really hard for us to see, and it creates this dynamic where, where people who know us best and love us most are really usually the least likely to point something out because we've made it abundantly clear that we're not going to listen to them. And so in our pride, we get dismissive. In our pride, we get defensive. And so... They learn very early, I'm not going to say anything. I'm just going to ride in silence and hope everything works out. And we see this in Samson's life. 
you know, his parents are trying to point something out to him, and he doesn't even acknowledge him. He, it's just like it's just completely over his head. He doesn't even consider it. And in verse 7, it says, then he went down to the woman, and he liked her. Apparently, he hadn't even met her. I find kind of strange. I mean, he's rejecting what his parents are saying, and he's infatuated with this woman, somebody he's never, ever met. It's almost like an Old Testament version of that 60s rock song, Hello, I love you, won't you tell me your name? I mean, that's kind of what it's about. He, he hadn't even met this woman. Now, psychologists talk about this dynamic in a new romantic relationship. It's called limerence. It's a psychological response of infatuation that causes us not to see some things clearly in the early months of a relationship. It can actually be as, as long into a relationship, up to a year and a half. It's an overpowering infatuation that involves what's called intrusive thinking. And the idea is that they're not able to, to concentrate on, on other subjects because they're so infatuated with this person. And so they put this person up on a pedestal. They don't even really know them, but in their mind they've created all these things that are not, not necessarily even true. And so they're agonizing over things, whether or not they feel the same and reciprocating their feelings and all of that kind of stuff. And they're, they're living in fear, worrying about rejection as like the worst thing that could possibly happen to them is they being rejected. And it's this idea of limerence where you're not seeing things clearly at this infatuation stage in a relationship and you really need somebody alongside you who you've given permission to speak truth into your life, truth that you may not want to hear. And in other words, we can get to the place where we can't trust our own eyes. And we need somebody, we need the wisdom and the counsel of other people. And Samson's parents are trying to do that for him, and he has no humility to receive it. So blind spot number one is just refusing to listen to the counsel of people in your life who love you and care about you. Blind spot number two for Samson is, is he begins to compromise in these small areas. Things that don't seem significant are justifiable in the moment. And we find Samson taking shortcuts. He takes a shortcut here through a vineyard. And you might say, well, that doesn't seem like such a big deal. But you've got to remember his Nazarite vow. He's supposed to stay away from alcohol and even the fruit of the vine. And what's a vineyard? And now he's taking a shortcut through there. And once again, the shortcut is, is not only telling us something about his geographical direction, but it's telling us about his spiritual direction. And while he's in the vineyard, a lion comes upon him, and the Bible says that he tore the lion apart, you know, with his bare hands. And he would later return to this same lion his dead carcass and there would be a honeycomb inside this dead carcass and he would scoop out some of the honey and eat it out of the honeycomb we got a, a couple of uh, compromises here cutting through a vineyard touching a dead body and dead carcass and here's something that's very interesting in verse 6 the Bible tells us that he neither told his father or mother what he had done he kills a lion in the vineyard, but he doesn't tell his mom and dad. Just to be clear here, if I ever killed a lion with my bare hands, I would have been yelling, hey, mom, guess what? You'll never believe what happened to me today. I would have been taking a picture of it and calling my dad and say, hey, guess what? Look what son you raised. I would have started this sermon off. As an introduction, and every introduction to every sermon I ever preached probably would have been saying, there was a time I was walking through a vineyard and this lion came upon me. I mean, I would have included it as much as I could, but he doesn't say anything. 
And you begin to see this pattern of compromise and cover up in Samson's life. And this is a significant blind spot for us. And it's connected to our pride. There's compromise in our lives. And when we cover up, we see something in, in the side view mirror, something maybe small for a moment, and then it, it seems insignificant, and we don't realize how big it might be gaining on us, and we don't realize how quickly it's coming. And when we have this pattern of compromise and cover up, that is a huge blind spot. Verse 11 tells us it's day one of a seven-day feast, of a, the marriage feast, where Samson is now going to marry this woman from Timnah. And, and, and there's 30 groomsmen who were a part of the wedding, and Samson begins to have a bet with these 30 groomsmen, who are all Philistines. And he says, hey guys, if you can solve this riddle that I give you, I'm going to give each of you a set of clothes. But if you don't solve it, then each of you will give me a set of clothes. And, and the riddle Samson gave was in verse 14, where it's out of the eater something to eat, out of the strong something sweet, which was a reference to the lion and the honeycomb, and the honeycomb that's inside it. And they have no idea. They have no clue what, what he's talking about. And it, four days into this, it becomes clear that there is no way they're going to solve this on their own. So what they do is they go to their, his bride-to-be, and, and they threaten her life, and they say, look, if you don't give us the answer to this riddle, we're going to kill you. And we're not only going to just kill you, we're going to kill your family. We're going to kill your family. And so she begins to manipulate Samson into giving them the answer. And so they go to Samson, and they solve the riddle. Well, Samson's not happy. He's offended. And, and it's his own fault, I mean, that he's in this situation. But he is offended, and he gets upset. And verse 19 tells us how he pays the debt. He goes out, and he kills 30 Philistines and gives them their clothes to the, to the groomsmen. And Samson's blind spot that I want to draw attention to here that's connected to pride is that he is easily offended, which creates, he, cre he creates these situations. You know, I, I mean, he does. People react in one way, and he doesn't like what happens, and so he gets offended, and then he vows revenge. And he's constantly making it about himself. All the way from birth, he, he's set apart to accomplish this great mission for God, but it always seems that he ends up being offended by other people, and he always ends to make this all about himself. Chapter 14 ends with Samson not showing up at the wedding. He's upset about what happened. He, he doesn't come to the wedding. Everybody's there. The father of the bride said, hey, I've already paid for this. We're going to have a wedding. And so she, he gives his daughter away to the best man, and you guess Who's not happy about this? The strongest man in the world. Chapter 15, he wants his wife back. And her dad says, stay away. And Samson swears vengeance against the Philistines. He is offended and he makes it personal. And he wait, we just constantly are waiting for him to take the lead. Constantly waiting for him to fight selflessly and all that for freedom and this mission that God would have him. But it seems like Samson can't get out of junior high school. Samson gets offended. He wants revenge. And here's what he does. He goes out and he catches 300 foxes and ties their tails together, which I'm gathering was a pretty incredible feat to take 300 foxes and be able to tie their tails together. I mean, that's interesting, harder than it sounds. And he ties them a torch to these tails and he turns them loose in the Philistines field and basically he knocks out their economy out of this you know, the foundation of their economy with this act of revenge. And I think it's worth noting, Samson's always petty. <laughs> He's always petty. He's always selfish, always prideful, always vengeful. But that doesn't keep God from accomplishing what God wanted to accomplish through him. God still... Excuse me. God still is going to do what God has planned to do, and he's still working to free his people from the hands of the Philistines. And at the end of chapter 15, we see Samson has led Israel for 20 years. But it doesn't seem like much has changed, because chapter 16 begins, one day, Samson went to Gaza, which is in the Philistine area, 
where he saw a prostitute and he went to spend the night with her. Here's Samson 20 years later and he's doing what he's always done. He still has the same blind spots. Nothing seems to have changed. And this is where Delilah comes into the scene. And this is where we're more familiar with his, his account. The Philistines come to Delilah, who is Samson's girlfriend, and say, Hey, we'll give you 1,100 shekels of silver, which is the equivalent, I think, I've heard as much as $15 million. Seems like a lot. But still, it was a lot of money. It was a good payday, okay? For her to just find out the secret to his strength. Consequently... She begins to manipulate Samson, with, and the story we've seen later, it's like 20 years later, and she's doing the same thing, and he's fallen into the same trap, and she begins to coerce him. And verse 13, or 15 says, oh, how can you say you love me if you will not confide in me? And then verse 16 says, with such nagging, she prodded him day after day after day until he was tired to death. So here's this guy who can catch 300 fox t and, uh, foxes, tie them together by their tails, and he's no match for this woman who is nagging him. And here's the connection I want you to make here. His physical strength, I think, made him overestimate his strength in every other area of his life. If he's strong enough to catch 300 foxes, if he's strong enough to take a, a, on a lion with his bare hands to kill it, if he's strong enough to do all that, he's strong enough to connect with somebody like Delilah and be able to stand up to her and deal with her, but he doesn't see his weaknesses. And I think in part it's because he's so strong in his physical life. And in verse 19, after she's manipulated him and after she has cut his hair, the Bible says his strength left him. And in verse 20, it's probably the most tragic statement and telling verse in, in this entire account. Because it said, but he did not know that the Lord had left him. Can you imagine that? He didn't know. That's how self-reliant he had been how he was used to taking the glory for himself, and he had become so, so arrogant. The Lord left him, and he didn't even know it. He was used to taking the credit. He was, he was used somewhere along the way. He used to think that all of these things that have happened in his life was because of him. And God leaves him, and he's not even aware of it. Well, as we wrap this up, I want to ask you to address a few of Samson's questions in your life. And I want us to use these questions as a way for us to check our blind spots. And so they're not just rhetorical questions. I really want us to kind of contemplate them in our heart of hearts. And question number one is, do I listen to the counsel of others? Do I listen to the counsel of others? Think back, if you can, when was the last time someone you know who, who cares about you deeply said something to you that was difficult for them to say and was hard for you to hear? And there must be some reason why at times that we may not hear from some people in our life. Maybe it's because that person just doesn't know us well enough and they can't see, you know, uh, they can't see the needs that happen in our life that need to change. Maybe, maybe because they, they know we're not going to listen, so they don't even bother to tell us. And they're like, what's the point anyway? And for some people, it's exactly the same people that it was for Samson in his life, his mom and dad. Or it might be a sibling. They love them so much and care for them so much and are praying for them all the time and... The person would just won't hear what they have to say, but they need to hear it. Maybe a brother or sister who sees some things going on in your life that's concerned them and it's hard for you to hear it. But you got someone who, who might see something that, that you can't see. And if you're humble enough even to listen to them, 
it'll make all the difference in the world in your life. Instead, we're immediately defensive. And we start to, to withdraw from that person and like, who are you to say that to me? So how do we respond? Do we listen to the counsel of others? Question number two, do I compromise in small things? See, only you really know this because these are often the things that other people can't see. But if we've begun to compromise in small things only to cover them up so that nobody knows them, that's a red flag. And if we're compromising and covering up, that's a blind spot that needs to pay attention and we need to address it in our own lives. Question number three, somebody says, are, are you easily offended? Are you easily offended? Somebody says something to you and, and we almost always take it the wrong way. You know people that are that way, don't you? We've worked with them. We've gone to school with them. We, they may be living across the street from us. There, there's all sorts of people we know that as you say something, they're, they're taking it the wrong way. They're sensitive, defensive when somebody tries to say something. Not only that, these are people that typically, they've got a list of offenses that they hang on to for other people through the years who when they come up and they see or say, uh, see this person or hear this person's name mentioned, their mind automatically goes back to that offense. That person may have completely forgotten what happened, but they bring that offense up of what they may have said, how they offended me, and they may not even know it. But you know what that is? That's our pride. And we need to repent. We need to repent. We need to humble ourselves. The Bible tells us that we are to have the same grace for others that God has for us. Question number four. Am I aware of my weaknesses? And so don't just say, yeah, I have weaknesses. I mean, who doesn't have weaknesses? But what are areas that you know that you're vulnerable? Have we taken that kind of an inventory in our lives where we need to pay attention and when we find ourselves repeating mistakes over and over or we overestimate our strength we need that needs to remind us that we need to become aware of a blind spot samson ends his life ends with him in the custody of the philistines <clears throat> he's lost his strength he's lost his eyesight he's, he's been blinded and he's now put in prison and the day comes where the Philistines are having what would be like a pagan worship service. Where they bring out, uh, uh, in celebration, they bring Samson out and they want to mock him. Or as some translations say, make sport of him. They're poking fun at him because he is now their entertainment. Here is this man who had caused such great destruction in their nation. They're seeing him weak. They're seeing him blind. And, and so they bring him out. And so Samson asked to be stood next to a couple of the pillars in the temple that happened to be the support pillars of the temple. And he does something that he has never done up to this point. He asked God for help. Because up to this point, we don't ever hear him praying, do we? We never hear him asking God for help. And, and so that's what he does. He asks God, and look at verse 28. Because he seems to understand that God is the source of his strength. It says, verse 28, Samson prayed to the Lord, Sovereign Lord, remember me. Please, God, strengthen me just one more. Then it goes off the rails. And let me, one blow, when one blow, get revenge of the Philistine for my two eyes. Now, he does something right here. He acknowledges his weakness. He acknowledges he needs God's help. But he's missing the point. He still doesn't get it. He thinks this is all about his eyes. And that's not what this is about. From birth, he's been set apart. He had been given a mission by God to help free his people from the Philistines. And in his final moment, He's obsessed with the fact that they gouged out his eyes. And he wants revenge. And so 3,000 Philistines with, with all the Philistine leaders and they're gathered there together and he takes 
out those columns and the roof collapses and he dies with his enemies that day. I was reading a quote from Chip Henderson who wrote a book on Samson's life. It was called A Life Well Wasted. And he said, Samson's story is not so much a study in what amazing things he did as it is about the amazing things he could have done. See, Samson needed to humble himself and, and he needed to ask God for help. And, and he, he just never got to that place where he would do it. And here's what we have at the end of his life. We have somebody who was humiliated and, and still isn't humble. Have you ever, ever met anybody like that? I mean, if there are some blind spots of pride in our life, maybe we got to take some time and, and listen to the counsel of other people. Or maybe uh, we're too easily offended. Or maybe we're compromising and covering up small areas and things in our life. When we, what we need to do is to humble ourselves. Because you don't want to wait to be humbled. You don't want to wait to be humiliated. But we want to humble ourselves and acknowledge our weakness and cry out to God for help. Because what does God do? He hears our pleas. He hears our cries. He will help us. And we put our dependence upon him. And we understand his strength. You don't want to drive any further down the road without it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord. Because of Jesus, we can come to you and we can find grace. And Lord, I, I, I know that I'm not the only one who's run off the road a time or two because I've missed a blind spot of pride in my life. Lord, I know these things are hard for us to learn. They're hard for us to think about. It's hard for us to see because of pride. And I know pride blinds us to pride. But Lord, I pray that you would help us see the truth. That you would allow us to humble ourselves before you, Jesus. That you'd come in, forgive us, forgive us of our sin, that you would give us your power and your strength to live out a mission that you've called us to live. I pray this in the matchless name of Jesus. Amen. This morning we're going to be using a hymn of invitation, 491, Jesus I Come. Out of my bondage and sorrow and night, Jesus I Come. If there's a need in your life today, we invite you to share that with us. Come forward, we'll meet you down front as we stand and as we sing. Hope you've been blessed as we've had this opportunity to be together today, and I hope you've enjoyed our time of worship and that we've had just a, a time to be able to sing songs of praise. And what a blessing to gather around the table of beloved memory and a chance to find encouragement from God's word. Don't forget the announcements uh, on, the, on the 
screens there. Men, today at 5.30, we have the Francis Chan study. It'll be happening, and so you won't want to miss. This is going to be a good one. It's really, well, they're all good, but Francis does a great job. And also, don't forget the Abundance Quartet uh, concert coming up on the, the, on the 30th. Invite a friend or somebody. Invite somebody. Let's, let's try to pack this place out, okay? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for allowing us the privilege and honor to just open your word. I thank you, Father, for the encouragement that your word gives us. Lord, I, I'm grateful that when, when Paul tells us in Corinthians that there's a reason that the Old Testament was given to us to help show us, giving us examples. And I'm thankful for the examples that, that you give us, and even in, in the life of Samson. Father, help us to check the blind spots of arrogance and pride in our own lives and help us to, uh, to be willing, Lord, to take the encouragement of, our, of family and friends who might have some words of encouragement for us to help us in a better way. Help us to not compromise your word or your way in small things in our lives. Father, help us not to be so easily offended but always looking Father, for keeping our eyes focused and fixed on you. and Lord, I just pray that you'll just continue to get, uh, give us direction that we need to go and bring others to, to, to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Lord, we pray that you'll dismiss us from this place, never from your presence, and bring us back to the next appointed hour. For it's in Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Have a great day.